So just a little caveat, I'm not reading a poem. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story about reading a poem. When I was a sophomore in high school, Mrs. McDonald, my English teacher, speech teacher, and drama coach, it was a very small high school, <laughs> told us that we were going to the state interpretive reading contest in Fort Scott, Kansas. She was taking five students, the exact number that would fit into her car comfortably. <laughs> I was delighted to be one of the chosen students. Well, actually, I was one of the few students who wanted to go. <laughs> she had to promise she would take us out to dinner after the contest to fill the other places in the car. She also let us choose our own readings. So early on the morning of state contest, I dressed carefully in my Sunday best, which was for me my Easter outfit. I put on my ruffly lilac blouse my lavender dirndl skirt, a pair of white lace tights, and the finishing touch, my white patent leather Mary Janes. <laughs> and what was this vision in pastel reading for her selection? Do not go gentle into that good night by Dylan Thomas. <laughs> Why I thought that someone who looked like a 12-year-old I could ride half fare on the Greyhound bus until I was in my late 20s. <laughs> Why I thought I could pull off reading a poem about death by the depressive, hard-drinking Welsh poet, I can only attribute to my need to be taken seriously. Though I had very little experience with death, I knew it was serious. I thought that if I read a poem about death, I would automatically be seen as an honorary adult. And it must be said that death played big at the state contest. No fewer than three participants that year read William Allen White's heart-rending tribute to his daughter Mary after her death in a riding accident. My teacher, Mrs. McDonald, arrived and I slid into the back seat. We picked up the last two students and headed to Highway 59 to start the 63-mile 63, 63 journey to Fort Scott. About an hour later, when we arrived at the two-story red brick Fort Scott High School, we discovered it looked exactly like the two-story red brick high school we'd left behind in Garnett, Kansas. <laughs> it was as if itinerant builders had roamed Kansas in the night <laughs> had roamed Kansas in the 1920s erecting cookie-cutter high schools in all the small towns. Everyone had readings scheduled at different times during the day, so I was able to see some of the other readers before my time slot in the early afternoon. I saw one of my classmates read one of the three tributes to poor Mary White, dead for almost 50 years when Kathy performed it. Still tragic after all that time, I was able to have moist eyes and a tear in my voice when it was time to read my selection. I introduced the poem. And I can remember reciting the first verse. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rage at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I do not remember reciting the rest of the poem. But I know that I did because the evaluation form would have mentioned it if I hadn't. <laughs> the evaluation form. It was a general consensus of the judges that such a cute, sweet little girl should not go against type. It was suggested that a light comedy reading or a children's poem <laughs> would be a more appropriate selection for me. I think that this critique was aimed at my teacher, not me, since they did not know I was the one who selected the poem I read. But I was furious. I was certain that this was blatant sexism. And after all these years, I do think there was some sexism involved in the evaluation. However, I was the one who dressed myself like a 12-year-old. <laughs> and with the wisdom of age, I know that my very high voice was probably a weird counterpoint to the words of the poem. Remember when I mentioned that I could ride half fair, fair well into my 20s? Well, 
It's only recently that phone solicitors have stopped asking to speak to my mother. <laughs> I was still angry about not having been taken seriously. And the part about reading a children's poem hit me especially hard. It was enough to put me off poetry for quite a while. I will tell you the following year, when state contest was in Topeka, I did not read a poem, nor did I read a lament for poor dead Mary White. <laughs> what did I read? A light comedy selection in prose, but that's another story. <laughs> that was wonderful, Sarah. It reminds me of uh, what we heard recently about Simone Biles being given a coloring book when she got on the airplane. <laughs> well, there seems to be a theme that I wasn't expecting today. Fifty years ago, um, the king of the small Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan decided that instead of emphasizing gross national product for their country, it would make more sense to pay attention to quality of life issues like the physical and social and spiritual well-being of the populace. And that became familiarly known as gross national happiness. Bhutan uh, got quite a reputation for having some of the happiest people in the world, and uh, that led to a lot of tourism, needless to say. Um, which may have lessened their happiness, this is true. <laughs> Um, but aside from uh, it making sense to pay attention to the people's quality of life, there is another aspect uh, that is believed to have uh, added to the happiness of the Bhutanese people. And it is because they are Buddhists, and Buddhism holds death very closely. It recognizes the... Um, now I can't think of the word, you know, the quick passing of life and how fragile it is. And there's a Bhutanese proverb that says, you should meditate on the fact that you're going to die five times a day. Now, that may sound a little bit morbid to those of us who live in this uh, culture, because we do kind of the opposite. We like to not think about death if we can help it and use euphemisms, to, you know, when it's near to us at least. Uh, like past or we lost somebody. Um, yeah, it makes sense to me um, that when you recognize that life is short and fleeting, that you're going to appreciate it more. And a 2007 study actually showed that, that contemplation of death produced an automatic coping response that led to an increase in positive emotions. Every time we're reminded that life is temporary, we enjoy it more. Now, if you were not fortunate enough to be born in Bhutan, you don't have to worry because our culture has come up with a remedy, and that is an app for your phone called <laughs> We Croak. <laughs> I have it on my phone. And it reminds us at random times, five, uh, five times a day though, um, don't forget you're going to die. <laughs> and then if you open it, it has a quotation. Uh, just now the quotation is, in the scenery of spring, nothing is better, nothing worse. The flowering branches are, are some long, some short. So, so sometimes uh, the quotations are more pointed towards death, sometimes not. But it gives you an opportunity, if you so choose, to take a moment to meditate on the fleeting nature of our existence. So with that introduction, uh, the short poem that I want to share with you today is not a poem from Bhutan. 
and it has nothing to do with Buddhism. It comes from quite a different culture, but I think you'll understand my attraction to it. It's called Testify by Eve L. Ewing. I stand before you to say that today I walked home and caught the light through the fence and it was golden and I wanted to cry and I lifted my right hand to say thank you God for the sun, thank you God for the chain link fence and all the shoes that fit into the chain link fence so that we may get lifted. God thank you. And I wanted to dance and it feels good to have food in your belly and it feels good to be home even when home is a space between metal shapes, still we are golden. And a man who wore the walk of hard grounds and lost days came toward me in the street, and he said, Girl, it's a beautiful day. And I said, Yes, testify. And I walked on, and someplace a horn rose, an organ, a voice, a chorus. Here to tell you that we are not dead. 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 dead. Yet. Yeah. Okay, I started writing poetry when I was very young and figured, well, I would say it, and then I figured out when I was about eight that if you wrote it down, you could go back and read it later. But this first poem was written in the 80s when both my boys were, with more or less success, in bands, like a lot of young men, and the house seemed to be full of musicians, and I was also running into musicians all the time at Mensa meetings for some reason. So anyway, this is a poem that's called, The Band Gets Back Together. Remember, remember when we talked all night and drank and drank drunk? Were we drunk? You smiled and said, this is everything. When was the last time you smiled like that? They made you smile in the casket, the coffin. Everyone stood around looking older, some fat, some like their parents used to look when we were kids on the block. When we thought we were wonderful, nothing like us. Before we sold out, well, you never did. Death bought your contract, death bought your life. Maybe, maybe we should have got together one more time, one more jam, one more song. We still knew the lyrics too. We still knew the music too. But Joe was in London, Dan was in Spain, and I was in L.A. feeling no pain. Stu was in Vegas, polyester king. It took you to bring us to one room, one gloomy room, full of smoke and memories of those good, bad, good, bad times. Were we ever that young, that fine? The lines in your dead face, the lines in that dead place. Goodbye, good try, my brother of the same music mother. Goodbye. These next three were written this year. And I'm starting off with one about a, a creature we're all familiar with in Texas, grackles. The grackles are glossy with new feathers. Sounds? The same squeaks and squeals, the rusty note of a creaking gate call across the fields. The next poem was written because I saw a video about the displacement of the jungle in Borneo for palm oil plantations. It's called Borneo. One tree standing where once they stretched to the horizon, 
In the ragged tree, a frightened orangutan huddles and shakes. The ground shifts with the growl of earth moving, tree destroying machines, crushing the silence. And this last poem was kind of inspired by some of the horrible news that we've been hearing lately or for a long time. My face is your face. His face is her face. Their faces are our faces. The hands holding the dead child are the hands hugging the living child. The couple united in happiness is the couple drowning in fear. As we continue killing our cousins, forgetting the bond in blood and bone and cell and time, the thin thread spooling back. We live together, we love together, we destroy together, we die together. Our next speaker is the one professional up at the pulpit this morning, Nancy Barlow. <laughs> Actual qualifications in English. <laughs> Come on up, Professor. <laughs> but not in poetry. I <laughs> will say. Good morning. Good morning. The Irish poet Seamus Haney, Nobel laureate, says, anything can be enough to catch the heart off guard and blow it open. Moments of clarity, realization, insight, come to all of us at unexpected moments, often from the commonplace, everyday experience. And as an aside, I simply want to say that from this church, I have been so privileged to know Del Rogers, who was a poet of regional importance, who knew Naomi Shiab Nye, who introduced me to the Texas poets, Mitsu Bader, who was a master of classical Japanese poetry, and of course, Val, who has given us so many poems over the years. So thank you to all of those people. What poetry means to me isn't easy to pinpoint. When I was about four or five, I realized that fly, sky, high rhymed, and I could be a poet, my <laughs> poor mother. One of my first books was A Child's Garden of Verses by Robert Louis Stevenson, which I still have. Does anybody remember, oh, how do you like to go up in a swing, up in the air so blue? Oh, I do think it's the pleasantest thing ever a child can do. One day, I got it. I was up at that top of the swing, up in the air so blue, my heart exploded, as Haney says. I got it. That poem was written just for me. And in the decades since, many poems have blown open my heart. Mary Oliver, of course, on the birth of her grandson. Basho's haiku, red pepper pods, add wings, behold dragonflies. We have red dragonflies in our backyard. I liked Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now in 1969, but when I watched the video of her performance of the song at Newport a few days ago, wow, it caught my heart off guard and blew it open. I really don't know life at all. Now, the poem I want to read to you, Ode to My Socks, by Pablo Neruda, Chilean Nobel laureate, ambassador, social activist. An ode is a lyric poem to a particular subject, and Neruda wrote dozens of them. I think there's a book of 50, actually. In ancient Greek, odes were meant to be sung and danced to. This poem, An Ode to Ordinary Socks, makes me see the extraordinary and the commonplace and makes me feel the dance. Ode to my socks. Maru Mori brought me a pair of socks, which she knitted herself with her sheep herder's hands, two socks as soft as rabbits. 
I slipped my feet into them as though into two cases knitted with threads of twilight and goatskin. Violent socks. My feet were two fish made of wool, two long sharks, sea blue, shot through by one golden thread. Two immense blackbirds, two cannons. My feet were honored in this way by these heavenly socks. They were so handsome for the first time, my feet seemed to me unacceptable. <laughs> like two decrepit firemen, firemen unworthy of that woven fire of these glowing socks. Nevertheless, I resisted the sharp temptation to save them somewhere, as schoolboys keep fireflies, as learned men keep sacred texts. I resisted the mad impulse to put them in a golden cage and each day give them bird seed <laughs> and pieces of pink melon like explorers in the jungle who hand over the very rare green deer to the spit and eat it with remorse, I stretched out my feet and pulled on those magnificent socks and then my shoes. The moral of my ode is this. Beauty is twice beauty, and what is good is doubly good when it's a matter of two socks made of wool in the winter. <laughs> if I could add a short postscript to this, the poet knows we can, own, we can allow a soft gaze rather than a sharp attention to rest on an object, knowing only that we do not know it, like a piece of toast, maybe, a coin, a dandelion. It contains worlds within worlds and love beyond love that have yet to reveal themselves. Neruda saw those socks and his heart was blown open and he gives us the fruit from his heart, his joy, his wonder, his humility, and above all, his love. Good morning, everyone. Oh, the fabulous slide that Elena made with the venerable Billy Collins speaking. Keep that in mind as I am speaking. I first met Billy Collins in my home. That is, I had the radio on in my kitchen, and he was a guest on Prairie Home Companion on NPR. He was serving one of his two terms as U.S. Poet Laureate, and his words and how he presented himself won me over instantly. I found out that the New York Times had dubbed him the most popular poet in America, which is a very big flag as to how in touch I was with American poetry at the time. I became a fan. I bought his books. I listened each time he was on NPR or some other accessible place. And then one day I found out that he was going to be giving a one-day poetry workshop right here in Plano at Collin College. Workshop. That's different than a mere performance. I mean, he is a professor of this stuff. He teaches students in graduate fine arts programs. If it's a workshop, there should be things to do, things perhaps to learn about, but what? I'm not a poet. I mean, I have written poetry, but I was utterly without aspirations to do more of it when I learned of the workshop. I wanted to go because I was a fan. So at this college building, I presented myself at the office that was overseeing the event, and I pled my case. Yes, yes, I was a physics major, but please let me in. I like poetry as well as science. Any UU knows that. <laughs> Any UU understands. I was granted a space. 
I arrived the day of the workshop with a notebook and no idea of anything else. Billy Collins entered the room. His suit jacket was rumpled in the way that one would expect from a writing professor. His hair somehow also fit the part in a stereotypical way with strands expanding from a thin pate, and he proceeded to lead the workshop. He talked about how a poem has a voice, and that the voice in most of his work was that of a dilettante. <laughs> he dissected things he had written himself, not with the ego of an artist, but with the eye of an analyst. He answered our questions, many of which were coming from other poets. I love that he acknowledged the messiness of poetry, both writing it and reading it. I wasn't a poet when we started, and I wasn't a poet when we finished, but that's not what I wanted or needed. I just wanted to hear Billy Collins talk about poetry. I wanted to be at the workshop. Approximately 15 years before that day, Billy Collins published a poem about this very type of experience. And if you have ever been simultaneously baffled and enchanted by someone's writing, including your own, this is for you. And so I present Workshop by Billy Collins. I might as well begin by saying how much I like the title. It gets me right away because I'm in a workshop now, and so immediately the poem has my attention, like the ancient mariner grabbing me by the sleeve. And I like the first couple of stanzas, the way they establish this mode of self-pointing that runs through the whole poem and tells us that words are food thrown down on the ground for other words to eat. I can almost taste the tail of the snake in its own mouth, if you know what I mean. But what I'm not sure about is the voice, which sounds in places very casual, very blue jeans, but at other times seems standoffish, professorial in the best sense of the word, or the worst sense of the word. Like the poem is blowing pipe smoke in my face, but maybe that's just what it wants to do. What I did find engaging were the middle stanzas, especially the fourth one. I like the image of clouds flying like lozenges, which gives me a very clear picture. And I really like how this drawbridge operator just appears out of the blue with his feet up on the iron railing and his fishing pole jigging. I like jigging. A hook in the slow industrial canal below. I love slow industrial canal below, all those L's. Maybe it's just me, but the next stanza is where I start to have a problem. I mean, how can the evening bump into the stars? And what is an obligato of snow? <laughs> also, I roam the decaffeinated streets. At that point, I'm lost. I need help. The other thing that throws me off, and maybe this is just me, is the way the scene keeps shifting around. First, we're in this big aerodrome, and the speaker is inspecting a row of dirigibles, which makes me think this could be a dream. Then he takes us into his garden, the part with the dahlias and the coiling hose, although that's nice, the coiling hose. But then I'm not sure where we're supposed to be, the rain and the mint green light. That makes it feel outdoors. But what about this wallpaper? Or is it a kind of indoor cemetery? There's something about death going on here. In fact, I start to wonder if what we have here is really two poems, or three, or four, or possibly none. <laughs> but then there's that last stanza, my favorite. This is where the poem wins me back especially the lines spoken in the voice of the mouse. I mean, we've all seen these images in cartoons before, but I still love the details he uses when he's describing where he lives. The perfect little arch of the entrance and the baseboard. The bed made out of a curled back sardine can. The spool of thread for a table. 
I start thinking about how hard the mouse had to work, night after night, collecting all these things while the people in the house were fast asleep. And that gives me a very strong feeling, a very powerful sense of something. But I don't know if anyone else is feeling that. Maybe that was just me. Maybe that's just the way I read it. Thank you. Well, first, I want to say thank you to all of our readers and speakers this morning, Jeanette and Nancy and Valerie and Sarah and Joyce. Thank you so much for sharing your, your favorites and your perspectives and your insights. That's wonderful. And thanks again to Leslie for providing such lovely music. So poetry can go anywhere. Celebratory, wry, furious, passionate, mournful, thankful, bemused. Poetry can, contain, can convey every emotion a human being can have. Sometimes a poem is a scream into the existential dark, filling the spectrum between storytelling and song, poetry is language and feeling compressed. The poet plays with words, moving them around until a phrase finally catches the light, just right, to blind you or to illuminate a shadow or to just create a beautiful flash. If narrative speech is coal, then poetry is diamond. It's condensed, it's brilliant, it requires the light of time and thought to reveal its facets. Walt McDonald, who was a poet in West Texas and a professor at Texas Tech, used to say that a poem is like a bouillon cube. To get anything good out of it, you have to bring your own creative hot water. If you skim a poem or you're reading it with one eye on your Twitter feed, you might as well be nibbling on a bouillon cube. But if you take a little time with a poem, not brilliance, not advanced education or any special gift, just time and attention, then it blooms into a nourishing soup. Shards of it will stick with you and soon you have dozens or hundreds of these little poetry shards, little bits of diamond embedded in your soul. These are just a few of the little shards that run through my head. From T.S. Eliot's Preludes, and when I was in college and I was bored by a lecture, I would transcribed this poem over and over again in my notebooks as I half listened to the professor. It begins, the winter evening settles down with smell of steak in passageways, six o'clock, the burnt out ends of smoky days. Or another T.S. Eliot from the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk along the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. William Matthews, who is probably my favorite poet, has one called School Figures about watching his sister practice figure skating. That's why you skate it backwards. It's where you've been you have to go again, alert enough to numb every muscle memory but one. So much learning is forgetting the many mistakes for the few lines free of the flourishes you thought were style, but were only personality, indelible as it seemed. From Jack Gilbert's poem, Falling and Flying, he ends it, I believe Icarus was not failing as he fell, but just coming to the end of his triumph. 
It's good to read poems over and over again until they are part of the furniture in your head, part of the blocks that you use to build your internal world. And then once the ink has soaked into your blood, you may find yourself leaking poems from time to time. That's a good thing. As Valerie said, if you write them down, you can read them again later. Don't worry that you don't have the skill or the training or the credentials to write poetry. Some of my favorite bits of poetry are things I just jotted down that friends or children said spontaneously, like my daughter looking at a lake rippling in the wind and saying, that lake is full of stars. So if you are at all interested in poetry, these are two resources I can suggest. Joyce mentioned that she found her, the poem that she read on one of these. Poem a Day is from the Academy of American Poets, and Poem of the Day is from the Poetry Foundation, which publishes the Poetry Magazine, which I think is the longest continuously published poetry magazine in the US. It is certainly the most prestigious national. Um, so just do a web search. The URLs are up there on the screen if you want to grab those. But I would suggest taking a look. So I just want to say keep reading and writing poetry. It provides food for your soul that nothing else can.